Hello and welcome back to part two of New Forest Morphs daily blog and I hope you enjoyed blog number one with all the extra pairings. If you haven't had a chance to see it, just drop back on the previous video and you'll see what we're up to. In the intermediate break at half time, we decided to set up the camera, Jared, for the pairing. Yep. And we, which ones did we decide in the end? Uh, we went for the leopard, het clown, possible het pie yeah. to the passive. Let's have a quick look at it and just show everyone what we've done so you can see what we're hoping to record. And the nice thing about these head cameras is that they've got incredibly good 180 degree and they're not that expensive, I think they're 150 pounds for one of those. So the light's switching on at the moment. You can see that we've angled it that way, diagonal to diagonal. We've moved this time the bowl to this side so we don't get interference with that. So we'll see whether Mowgli's going to connect with his woman in the jungle. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they do, because we would love them to produce us a clutch, wouldn't we, Jared? To get leopard into super pastel clowns, killer clown leopards would be insane if we can get if we can hit it. We'd love it. So that's that one. Now I could take out a snake, Jared. Should we take out a snake to show everyone? Sure. Which one should we take out? So we haven't shown off before. Which one do you think would be nice? Should we bring out the desert ghost? I'd bring out the um Super gravel, she's just shed. Oh, yeah, she's just shed. So we've got the oh, super gravel, beautiful. Electra. She is gorgeous. Let's see whether she's prepared to come out. If she wants to come out. Oh, she's tucked into bed, Jan. I'm not going to disturb her. She's under under her bed. She is lovely. Do you want me to bring her out anyway? Yeah, I would. Yeah, okay. Right. She'll go back there afterwards. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll put her over here. Box and get her real beauty, Jad. It should be right out there. Huh? Should be right back around there. In the light box, she'll just mess it up. She's in a ball at the moment, but yeah, yeah. okay, we'll go back to the light, light box then. And I'll put her rug back up here so it warms up, yeah. ready for when she's back. Hello, gorgeous. Are you beautiful? There she is, Jad. So she's just shut out today. She is a super gravel and her name is Electra. And the name came because of these electric lightning bolts. In fact, that leads us nicely onto one of the powers of the force that we're going to talk about, which is the lightning force. And she's beautiful, isn't she, Jan? She weighs about 1300 grams now. She's only a couple yeah. hundred grams off. Nearly ready. So she's eating like an absolute trooper. And we've got an ivory, a super pastel ivory to go with her. Yeah, so. how's the boy doing? Is he almost really up good. to size? Yeah, Any idea on his weights? I think he's six and a half. Should we weigh them and see how close they are to breeding? Just okay. have a quick look. It's, it's nice to show a few snakes on each film, Jared, while they talk all the time. I think people enjoy watching, seeing how they're developing. So it's Alpha, Alpha and Amiga. So if I bring him in here, so he's going to be big enough to go into a big rub soon, isn't he? Yeah. So let's just see where, there he is. There we go, fella. Watch it, I'm going to guess the weight, Jad. So this is our future pair here. They're almost up to mature level. I'm going to guess 600 for him. What's your guess? Yeah, I'll say about that. 600? 500, 600. 613. 615. So technically, he's ready. He's ready. If you, what, we Whether could... he's mature enough is another question, but she needs a bit longer still. Yeah, I think. Jad's feeding the babies. He's doing a great job, but do you want to meet your wife? To be a future wife. Let's go and bring them both in the light jug and see how they're looking. Now, there we go. If you just move my paperwork, Jared, just move that out of the way for a second. Let's just have a good look at these two. And uh, I think they're gorgeous. So he's going into shed at the moment. Is he moving into shed? Yeah, see his pink belly. Yeah, there we go. We'll put her there. And then we'll give them a little bit of pre, we're pre, we're pre introducing them. We're not going to let them breed, but we'll let them get used to each other's hormones and sounds. But you can see, Jared, just how he is going into shed, isn't he? But yeah. look at the lovely colours on him, though. Yeah, the camera doesn't pick it up too well. Yeah. But, um, when he's out of shed, you'll see it even more. There's lovely yellow stripes on him. Let me get the lighting on the table, Jared. See it, I might bring it down. See, what the nice thing is, we can move the lighting on the cuddle. Does that help me? Should make it better. I can drop the table back. Do you want to get no, good yeah. lighting? Okay. Are they good there? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, there you go. Alpha is the boy and Electra is the girl. So we'll have the meeting of those two. Probably, I'm guessing it'll probably be October later yeah. this year that they'll go together because I think she's not really big enough. We don't want to 
push her too early. She's still quite young and even though she's packed on the weight she may not be sexually mature and the danger is to go in too quickly and I'd rather be cautious and careful Chad. Yeah. If she surprises us in a couple of months and she gets like 16, 1700 we might have to look at it but if not we'll wait patiently for the beginning of the season. Yeah. So patience is very much the name of the game even though we're loving we want to, Wayne showed us in the last live um, video that we put out that he's shooting for a super pastel uh, oh. highway. Now if you put these two together, because he's got super pastel and she's got super gravel, we're guaranteed to have highways. And pastel highways. Pastel highways, which I think on their own are a beautiful, beautiful combo. But I'd love, when I saw Wayne's picture of the super pastel, Jared, it's another level. Yeah. So what, what, what we do, Wayne, is as a building block, we build this first to get the first babies out and then we'd have, if we end up producing a super um, highway, pastel highway, we, and it, say it was a girl, we could put the boy to that again, couldn't we? And he's got super pastel, so then we could end up with a super pastel highway. Yeah, so you'd produce a pastel highway and bring it back to the dad. Yeah. To potentially get super pastel. So we could do that as a second phase of the project. Which you could get super pastel, super ivory highway. Wow, that'd be interesting. Is it possible to also go for a? I'm trying to think what else are combos. Can you? You can. Only, can you get a double super there then? That's what you're saying. A super pastel and a super yellow belly. I think so. Can you get a triple super? Can you get a super gravel, super? I don't. Yellow belly and super pastel. I think only if you breed two supers to each other. Right be interesting to see whether that's doable to get a triple super and one animal. If you had a super pastel, super ivory, super gravel, yeah. and bred that to another super pastel, super ivory, super gravel, yeah. then you would. Yeah. Well, they seem happy there. We'll leave them there while we're doing our little chat. I need my notes, Jared, so I'm going to just grab those. And then we're going to be taught a little bit by someone who has produced a lovely film for us to help us understand about agency and mind tricks, the Jedi mind tricks, Jared. So when you first saw your first Jedi mind trick, did it make you laugh or what was your thoughts on that when you first saw the mind tricks being introduced on the, on the movie Star Wars? I think the first one I saw was from the second movie, mm -hmm. as in the, um, the one with Anakin when he was, when he was young. Yeah. And um, Obi-Wan was getting sold cigarettes yeah. And he's like, you don't want to sell me death sticks. You need to go home and rethink your life. <laughs> yeah, that made me chicken. That, that was always a good one when I was young. That's a classic, isn't it? Uh, I remember that very well. And that's an example of a mind trick. But in reality, mind tricks are happening all the time. We talked about it yesterday with the government, how they present their information. They can sometimes sway us to think a certain way, which may not necessarily be good for us. And we need to be discerning and know whether they're telling the truth or not, that we're not going to act on bad advice. And that applies to everyone around us. We're, we're influenced by people around us. So being in control of your thought processes and being independent and being unbiased is a very important part of seeking truth. If you start following the crowd, or you start following strong opinion, popular opinion isn't always the right answer. That's why I don't watch the news. Yeah, you find it depressing, Terry, don't you? I just don't believe half the stuff as well. Yeah. I think there's a lot of rubbish fake, being put out. Fake news, yeah. But I think on the other hand, you want to keep yourself up to date with current affairs because the danger of not watching the news is that you might not be aware of current things. Now, current news, the reason why I do a news insert on this blog, particularly in this day and age, is we need to keep ourselves to speed of what's going on with this virus and discern truth so we can make corrective behaviour and decisions. So I think it's actually very wise to be in touch with the news, but be selective. I use Newsnight a lot because I find it's an educated program with intelligent people talking about the real issues. Whereas I find <clears throat> there's a lot of sensationalism out there that newspapers and TV companies want to get bums on seats and sell papers, therefore they beef up the truth or they mix it up and, yeah? Do you see what I'm saying, Jared? Yeah. So being able to talk about mind tricks is, I want to develop this, not just developing mind tricks, but I want be, us to be able to avoid being tricked as well. And you guys might be thinking, what on earth is he going on about? How does it apply to keeping snakes? Well, look, this is my take on it, okay? I believe that we don't respect the agency of these animals. And when I say agency, their ability to choose. Now you might think you're crazy, they don't have an ability to choose. Of course they have an ability to choose. Every living animal has the ability to make a decision one way or the other, whether it wants to eat, whether it wants to poo, whether it wants to sleep. So animals think and they're intelligent, more intelligent than we, than we parts think so. So a misinterpretation for today, for example, was Jag came in and said, Dad, they've tipped the wall over. And I suggested to him, 
when we did the head camera, uh, the cam lock video, for the very first time we actually put in two water bowls into the rub. And my first instinct was that Jupiter gravitated to both of them and she had a head on one and she had a tail on the other. And I was wondering, have we unlocked a new secret here that no one's tried before, which is to put two sources of water within the rubs to give them an option? One that's slightly warmer than the other. I'd like to know your views on that, but I think it's quite interesting. Because in the wild, they'll be surrounded by rocks, they'll be surrounded by different water features, and they'll go in and out of those to please themselves. So the more excitement you put in your rub, the more options they have, it makes them think, it makes them think really carefully. I've got to keep an eye on these two. They seem to be getting on well together, don't they, Joe? You're quite pleased with those. Yeah. Look, they've made a figure of eight. You guys need a little bit longer and then you can have a I think it's quite nice being supervised together and we can see that they're still building a relationship. They're not, I guess it's like teenagers going out and playing together but not having sex. It's like a, a bonding experience because I know a lot of husbands and wives knew each other in their teenage years. And, you know, it's all part about building relationships but they certainly are not freaked out by each other. They seem to be very compatible, don't they, Joe? Which bodes well from when we put them together. So supervised pairing underage is actually a healthy, a healthy thing, providing Maybe. you do not allow them to lock. Because <laughs> okay? that wouldn't be good when they're not ready. But I like the fact that they are, look, they've created a love heart. Can you see the love heart, Jack? Let me show you everyone the love heart. They're in love, look. Oh, I, I shouldn't have moved them, sorry. They created a love heart for us there. How about that, guys? That could be a, a Jedi sign, body language. Well, I read that as body language as compatibility. Coming back to Rob's point. They're not bumming to bumming and scarpering off the table, freaked out. They fancy each other, don't you think so, Jared? Maybe. Yeah. Anyway, they look great, and this is the makings of a wonderful project. But just coming back to the point I'm trying to make is that I put two water bowls in the rub, Jared. And you said, Dad, I did. We don't want to put two water bowls in everything. You didn't like the idea. I don't think it's needed. Yeah. But it's the first time I've seen it, and I was looking at behaviour. And I was thinking, I might not think they need it, but do they need it? Do they think they need it? That's the question. And I think too many breeders, I think, look at it from their perspective all the time. And we get bombarded with protocol. You've got to breed at nine o'clock. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do that. You've got to stay within these rules. Now, these are all safety measures and recommendations, but we have most of our successful feeding at four o'clock in the afternoon, but we know how to simulate nighttime conditions. So therefore we get away with it. So I think we need to break with the straight jacket, guys. Keep the rules on the back burner and stay close to them because they're safe, but follow the instincts of your animals. Let go. Feel your way into this hobby. Don't be um, too rigid, otherwise you're going to miss a trick. Is that a fair enough comment, Jared? Yeah. Use yeah. common sense as well, though. Yeah. But I'm one of these guys that generates a lot of ideas. I'm an ideas man, and one out of a hundred will be fantastic, and the other 99 will be shelved. But that's okay, because if one of those fantastic ideas gives us something that's going to unlock a problem, it's worth generating the ideas, even if the other 99 may not be cool. So I'm gonna come up with lots of different quirky ideas and a lot of you might say, nah, not, not doing that. And others might say, hmm, that's not a bad idea. If it helps, then it helps, but I'm, that's how I think. I think very, I have a lot of lateral thinking. You can tell from by my personality that I like to play different characters and there's a creative side to me that's let loose. Since we put this facility, Mandy sees me as a let loose person, creatively wise. I'm not this boring old accountant stuck in an office pen pushing numbers, but I've actually got a personality and I've actually got something I want to give. And this is a great form for me for stress relief. Now, we're going to be putting in 14 hour days to achieve all this, but I love it because this isn't work for me. This is pure pleasure and my enjoyment. It's given me a break. I was up at five this morning, done three hours work before we've come in here and I'll be doing another six or seven later. But this gives me an hour of just of a breather in between that I can be refreshed. They say, do a hobby or an interest refreshes you without necessarily resting. Now look, they're giving us the V's, Jared. Yeah? V for victory. Let's see if she'll go around my neck. She might go around my neck. She's quite calm at the moment. I'll pop this a little bit. Do you want to put him back there? Okay, so some of the Jedi tricks that people use in breeding snakes is they take sperm off the male and rub it onto the female. So 
they're trying to simulate a reaction, creating the hormones and trying to trick the animal into breeding because he thinks another male might be on the female. So you get sperm from another male, you put it on the female, then you put the other male in and because he can sense the smell of another male, it activates him. So that's a mind trick, isn't it? There's lots of mind tricks that we use in bull pythons, Jared. Can you think of any others that we do to, to help them get into the mood or think in a certain way? We use the weather to our advantage. We use the weather, but that isn't a mind trick. That's the reality of they want to breed in low pressure. But I'm thinking, what do we do to manipulate the situation to get them to do the things we want them to do? There's things that we can do. I mean, the fact that we're simulating such good ambient temperature, we're trying to simulate the African temperatures here. Outside, it's freezing cold. In here, you might as well be on holiday. I'm burning up in this outfit just for the benefit of being a Jedi. But we simulate the atmosphere and we're giving them a mind trick. We're putting them in an atmosphere that they, they're comfortable in. There's all these things going on, and some are good and some shouldn't be done. We should never manipulate an animal for our advantage, always for their benefit is the number one rule. And when we study this mind trick, you'll find that those on the light side of the, of the hobby would only use a mind trick for, for defense, protection, or for the betterment of the individual. They will never, the moment you get into mind tricks, you're moving towards the dark side. And you'll look at, say, Master Yoda will never inc teach any of his pupils mind tricks when they're in the temple. This is something that's often developed later as you mature, knowing that you can go in and out of that carefully and safely without abusing it. And I think we need to do the same in our snake keeping, that we shouldn't manipulate our snakes. And one example would be, give them a choice on where they want their water bowl. If you buy a system which has a fixed water bowl, you've taken away their agency. They haven't got the option to move that water bowl and they don't end up with a a gradient, their, grad their water gradient, their cooling gradient can't be regulated by their water movement. Whereas all our bowls are unfixed. It gives the snake a chance to move the water wherever they want to feel comfortable. It's not a right or wrong, this is just opinion. Yeah, so this is my opinion. I think that our way suits us and for other people their way may suit them. But we've got to be open-minded and flexible. But I'm just showing, I want to respect the agency of the snake so it can move the water bowl where it wants to move it. That's one example. Hides, allow them to use one or not. Now we've not used the traditional hides in any of our rubs here, Jared, have we? No. Except for one that was a cyst fed. It's only one we've used. A lot of people will say, aren't you taking away their agency? They've got no hide. And that's a good point. And I have to rethink my thinking on this and think, should we be putting hides in there? But in reality, they're using We've got two layers of paper going in. So if they want to hide, they can. And they'll hide under paper. And I feel more comfortable having a natural bit of paper in there than a bit of plastic, you know. But that's just my feeling on that, Jay. What's your thoughts on, on hides? I think if they're in a vivarium or in an open space, then I think they definitely need them. But when yeah. they're in a rub system that's dark anyway and pretty compact, yeah. I don't think they personally need it. Okay. So at the moment, we're keeping an open mind to that one, but we are giving them more paper at the moment because I found that an animal is a lot more settled and less stressed with a, with a home to cover. So I think that's given, give them the choice. Maybe put a hide in there, see if they like it. If they don't like it, take it out, give them more space. So play with your feelings on that one. Um, the other thing is the choice. You can get some stagnant moss or you can get some wet pads that we're using wet pads for them to get humidity. Now this leads me on to another point, which I've never seen in any textbook, but I'm learning as a new newbie coming in here with no preconceived ideas. And I like that because I can think freely and be a little bit controversial, but sometimes controversy leads to good ideas and it's okay to go to think outside the box. So let me get your views on this one, Jared. We talk about the need of having a temperature gradient to give them a choice of where they want to put their body. Now a temperature gradient normally is 90 degrees on the heat spot and 80 degrees at the bottom end of the rub. And the 80 degrees is achieved because you've got a good ambient temperature in the room and you've got 90 degrees in the rub. And so therefore they've got a 10 degree differential as to where they want to go. Does that make sense, Jared? Mm -hmm. Now Rob hasn't got the gradient. He has to work really hard to maintain his snakes in the sense that he's got to keep an eye on what's going on, I'm guessing, because there's no gradient in the rubs. So when he's breeding, he's got to be very careful when he gets a spike in temperature, because the male might move into the kill zone and it could kill the sperm. So he's got to have 
backup systems, which I'm guessing he's got fans in his ambient air conditioning. Air conditioning. He can adjust the temperature in the room, even if it's really hot outside in Malaysia. So he's got his own way of regulating it. So his heat gradient isn't in the rubs, it's on the outside of the rubs. Now we've got both. We can regulate ours inside and out, which has given us double, double protection. 10 minutes left? Okay, so I'm now gonna to say to you the benefit of having the heat gradient's very good, but have you ever thought about having a humidity gradient? I feel like it's just really hard to achieve because the humidity's in the air. So I'm going to put I Electra back. Be, okay. I think she's had enough time with us, but thank you, Electra. I'm going to sit you back. Could bring out another one, but I think we'll just put this one back, Jared. So, so tell me my thinking on having a humidity gradient, Jared. Yeah. Okay, let me just see if I can get Electra here. Hello, darling. It's okay. It's a baby. It's okay. She does suit my um, Jedi outfit, doesn't she? Yeah. Yeah, she's actually getting a muscle build. She's she's actually constricting my arm at the moment. Do you want to go home? You want to get her, or you want to come and play? So she wants to play, Jay. I'll keep her out a bit longer if she wants to play. I reckon she'll go in. You reckon she'll go? In? Yeah. Again, I don't want to force my will on her. If she wants to come and play, I'll let her play. I'll, I'll try and put her back. But if she wants to come out, I'm gonna let her come out and play. She's about 1300, Jack. We didn't weigh her, but I think she's 1350. She's not far off. Yeah. But I think she's too young to go. I think I'd like to give her another six months anyway. Yeah. There we go. But I think she's building follicles and I think she's getting herself ready. Yeah, because she's not even two years old yet. No, look, she wants to come and play, Jack. Look, see? You have to respect that. So I think I'd like to keep her out for a bit longer. So this is the very point I'm trying to make here. She's teaching us a point not to. Obviously, if you're busy, you've got to put them back, but we've got a bit of time on our hands. So let's. Let's bring her out. Either that or she's looking for a mate. Come on, darling. You wanna come out? She's kind of wrapped around the ball. I think I will stick her back, Jad. There you go, darling. Anyway, it's really important to um, give your snakes some time out from their rub. Exercise, bonding time. And do you see how I introduced them to his future partner there? That was a very good sign for me. I'm reading their body language and saying that they probably will be a very good couple going forwards. So I'm very pleased about that. So let's come back to the um, gradients on humidity. Why do you think I think a uh, humidity gradient's worth having, Jared? I think, it, I think it would be good. I just don't think it's achievable very well. Okay. So if you've got cocoa husk and you spray it down, you get quite an even humidity, don't you? Except that the heat mat and the temperatures are gonna give off different effects on that water that's in the cocoa husk at different levels. So you're gonna get a type of humidity gradient. But I think the use of smog, uh, the moss or, or the pads that we've been creating, we can put those pads anywhere in the rub. It gives them a choice of staying on dry bedding or moving on to that wet area. They've got a choice. So therefore, like the temperature gradient, a snake doesn't want to dehydrate because did you know that most people that go to hospital, 50% of people that go to hospital are made better by two simple things. Do you know what they are, Jared? Yeah. Go you on. told me so many times. Right, I'm seeing if you remember. <laughs> Tell us what they are. Good food and not dehydrating. Rehydration. Most people go in, ill into hospital because they're dehydrated and they've been eating bad food. And the nurses and doctors I speak to say that once you put them on the, I know the food in the hospitals is the greatest, but it's nutritious and it's healthy. That you eat that and you drink lots of fluids, that's the thing, that's the medicine that's gonna get you better. Now that made me start to think about our hospital and how we're treating our snakes. So this week I've been experimenting with a more natural approach where I've allowed them to heal themselves by not disturbing them. And what I've done is I've been on point with humidity on point with temps and I've given it more time and attention and I've found that we've seen a huge improvement in all the snakes that we're looking after at the moment and I haven't even given them any man-made medication I've literally let them heal themselves naturally so the Jedi teaches a principle that says it's called the hibernation principle where you allow a snake to rest from they don't eat they don't fast they put all their energy into healing and there's another principle that we can talk about on a future video about the power of healing. So I'd like to cover that at a later point. Um, now, the other thing that we can discuss is what about um, food? 
Are we giving our snakes the same food day in, day out, or at least week in, week out, or are we mixing it up and are we giving them a variety? Now, if you, say Jess get, gave you your favorite meal seven days a week, would that meal still be your favorite, Jared? Depends. What is your favorite meal? I don't really know, to be honest. Like, Jess is a great cook and Jared eats well, don't you, Jared? Mm. And so, he gets a good variety in his food, but if you end up with the same food week in, week out, you get bored with it and it doesn't make you feel great. Food should be rejoiced and enjoyed. Now, with our snakes, we can give them a mouse, we can give them a multi, we can give them a rat. I mean, and obviously if the snakes get particularly big, they get a bigger prey item, different sizes. So I would suggest that mix it up, give them a variation on the food, if it works for you, and you'll find that the welfare of your snake you know, and sometimes they'll let us know, they will refuse certain food, they want, they want to mix themselves. So food is another thing. Um, handling. Give them a choice on handling. Do they want to be handled or do you want to handle them? Respect the choice of your animal. I respected the choice of that girl, put her back. She wanted to come out for a bit longer, but obviously I thought it was time for her to go back. But she had a good 10, 15 minutes with us, okay? Um, so think about things to avoid. You don't want to be touching your females when they're gravid, Jack. Why is it important not to touch gravid females? Well, you don't want to endanger the eggs. Yeah. Or stress them out so they don't produce the eggs. Now, Rob put it out on his video. He said that the big mistake, new, new people coming into the hobby, they touch their animals too much. And he said there's times just to leave them. There's obviously times to clean them, but you shouldn't be taking out girls that are going through a big breeding cycle, they're in a lot of stress, you only stress them out. And that's one of the reasons why girls get stressed out, it can lead to a lot of problems. So sometimes it's good not to handle the snake, you've got to read the body language and not your own passions. You shouldn't really touch a snake when it's in shed, you should allow it to shed out, just give it its moisture that it needs, give it its humidity, let it do its business. So that's another thing of respecting agency, don't handle shed snakes. Breeding. Rest between the breeding cycles. Don't power up your males every day and, and then wonder why they're knackered. You, like we've done two in this week, two, that's it. We're not gonna do five back to back, we're gonna do two, we're gonna rest them for four or five days. We're gonna put them in at the right time, we're not gonna breed them straight away after they've eaten, we've waited two days for digestion. So these are the things where our decisions are respecting them as an animal and we've got to learn these skills and be very respectful. Washing our hands between touching is showing respect for the animal. You're not gonna carry one problem to another if there is a problem there. So these are all little things. Hatchlings, handling hatchlings, you gotta be careful. Respect the choice of a hatchling. If you have to assist feed, the way you assist feed can affect their welfare and their future. All these things, we have to make decisions, but we need to respect the welfare of the snake and learn techniques that respect their choices. We would never force feed a snake, but we would feed them with the force. The Jedi Force. Healing. We take a more natural approach here. Perhaps we should only use the medics under veterinary advice. Perhaps we should try more natural remedies first, depending on the, where the snake is and where it's going. Obviously you've got to get it diagnosed. But I'm into natural healing. I don't take antibiotics unless I really need it myself. I don't like them. Um, and I take very little medication. I use all natural remedies and maybe we should consider natural remedies for our snakes. I'm doing an experiment this week and I'm actually not giving them any medication but I'm treating the snakes naturally by getting the humidity right, getting the temps right, being on point, ventilation and uh, everything like that and it will allow them to heal themselves in some ways and I'll, I'll give you a report next week and let you know how the snakes are doing. But it'd be very interesting to see whether that might be the key to unlocking our health issues. So, just in summing up, the mind trick of snakes is amazing to the point that in part three which is coming up shortly i'm going to be sharing what happens to the hognose snake he's got a particular technique where he's got his own mind trick to avoid being eaten and i'll show you a video that brian barchek put out which i was very impressed with which i'll show you on part three and we'll go into the second force which is the lightning force and we'll have three videos either to put, put up today or tomorrow but thank you for watching and we shall see you shortly